Legend of the Three Friends, which I think is a, uh, uh, you know, there were the three people who grew up and were friends with each other in the Seljuk Empire, and there's lots of stories about them. The first is somebody you've all heard about as a poet, Omar Khayyam, who's actually not that famous in Iran as a poet. He's more famous as a mathematician. But he's, you know, uh, a very much of a secular person, writes poetry, thinks about the world in a scientific view, and it demonstrates that that kind of mentality was part of the Muslim world at the time when we're there. The second was a man by the name of Hassan Sabah. Hassan Sabah is a little more problematic because we mainly know about him through stories told about him by his enemies. Uh, when Marco Polo got to the court in Baghdad of the Seljuks, uh, the, the Seljuk Empire had declared war on the Nizari Ismaili uh, branch of Islam. And uh, they told this story about a man called the Old Man of the Mountain, who, uh, what he did was he was spreading the Ismaili point of view, and he would talk to these young men, and he would get them really stoned on hashish, and they would pass out, and then he would take them to the mountains, and they would wake up in this pleasure palace with beautiful women and wine and flowing gardens, and he would tell them, this is paradise. And if you kill for me, if you murder for me, when you die, you will go to paradise. And then they'd pass out again, and they'd be back home in their beds, and they became known as the Hashishans, which is where we get the term assassin. That story is probably made up. I wouldn't even say properly. I mean, this is what... This was propaganda from the Seljuk state against their enemies that was passed on to Marco Polo. I mean, he's coming through and they're saying, these are really evil people, and they need to be understood in that way. Hassan Sabah, however, was the face of the Ismaili Dawa, the sort of the propaganda wing of the Ismaili Tariqat that was trying to get people to follow the current Ismaili Imam. He did have a fortress. Uh, in the mountains, uh, and what actually what goes on there, we really don't know. But this is an important figure, and he demonstrates that sort of mystical branch of Shiism and what was going on along the way. Uh, so we can talk more about him later in question and answer. The third friend, they all grew up together, right? And they, they, they dispersed as they got older, they had their, their elements, was a man by the name of Nizam el-Mulk. Nizam el-Mulk became the vizier the sort of prime minister to the Seljuk ruler. And he was a political science genius of the highest order. He established the basis not only for the Seljuk Empire, but for what became the way in which the new Sunni international order functioned. His argument was that the legitimacy of the Sultan did not rest upon being the son of the sword and the son of the sword and the son of the sword before him. I mean, because that's basically what rulers could always say. Why are you ruling? Because I can do it, and, and you can't stop me. And, and maybe you could say, and God wouldn't have let it happen if he didn't want it to. But he said, no, you have to have a greater sense of legitimacy. And that legitimacy will come from the fact that you will support Muslim institutions. In other words, your rule is legitimized by the fact that you build masjids. You build madrasas. You train the ulama, the people who have elm. Have, have you talked about this before, who the ulama are? The word ulama comes from the Arabic word ilm, which means knowledge. And specifically, it referred primarily to knowledge of Quran and Sunnah, but you needed to know other things as well. Uh, and so people who had this kind of ilm uh, were known as the ulama. And it was a you know, it was a difficult thing to become a learned person. You had to know uh, Arabic, and most people were not, at this point, were not native Arabic speakers. You had to know these sources. You had to know biographies, because you had to know if a hadith was real or not by being able to, to check the isnad. So you needed to know biography of people. So it was, a, it was a tremendous process to train people to become these scholars. That was the state's job. And by doing so, the uh, the... the the, 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 the emperor was able to uh, uh, demonstrate his legitimacy. And this becomes then the model for all of the empires that come forward. You have basically three 
sources of authority. One source is the people who are called the sultan or the emir. These are the military rulers, either the sultan, the ruler himself, or the functionaries that he sends out to govern in different places. And then you have the ulama who have all kinds of roles in the society, and some of them serve as qadis or judges in various places around, around the kingdom or the empire. And the third source of authority is the more difficult one. That's the Sufi peers. 